out of the range of the camera. And we'll also uh, work to make sure that if there's something you do want to share at that moment, but you may not want it on camera, we've, we've warned Thea about that. This is Thea Rajesh from HowlRound. She's our support here. So a couple of announcements. Uh, downstairs now, there are post-its per room so that tomorrow morning, if you decide you'd like to convene or be a part of an affinity group, you could sign up or start one. Yeah. Um, some of the rooms like this are larger, so you could say, hey, we'll be over in this corner and maybe draw a line and you know, create however many to share a room too. Um, also, I want to share with you that at 11.20, our space will become a space that includes everybody that's here in the building this morning in, in, within our confess, because we're making a special plan. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'd like to invite everybody to stay for that. And it will involve a plan for later today. So uh, we'll give more details then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> With that, is there anything else we need to mention? The, no now? public service announcements. I think that I think that's it for now. Yeah. This is uh, Mary Catherine Nagel. Hi. Good morning. She'll Good morning. she'll share more about herself. I'm Leslie Ishii, and I'd like to start as I often do with breath. So if we could, if you care to stand, lay down, or sit, I'll sit. Feel your feet on the floor. And at any time throughout our session, please, I have an acupuncturist that says, if you have pain or discomfort, move. Change your position. So feel that you can do that at any time. So feet on the floor. But hi, Jeff. Welcome. Come hey, on. Good morning. We're in Howl now, so just to let you know, anytime you can opt out of being visible. Knowing that we all share this dialogue that will go on this morning, acknowledging our privileges so that we make space for those who uh, have been underrepresented, endured oppression, knowing the barriers and the challenges to speak or be visible so that there is room and time to express for everyone to be heard as they choose. Continuing to breathe, bringing your hand to your belly. <sighs> Noticing you could also open up and widen your back as you breathe. <sighs> and in this next breath, we acknowledge our ancestors Breathing in and breathing out. Huh. Ah. Ah. And we acknowledge the land upon which we are set, the First Nations, indigenous natives that came before us and who are still with us now. Breathing in. Ah. Ah. Notice your breath, notice your rhythm. What is your rhythm if there's no need to regulate or manage your breath? <sighs> Can you just soften your jaw, <sighs> your shoulders? Breathing into your back. You could actually let the gut go. Maybe even teeter back and forth a little bit on your sit bones. Ah. Mm. Yeah. Feeling your feet to the floor. Again, the 
ground upon which we are set. Respect for Mother Earth and all who have traveled upon this ground. Uh. Acknowledging Oregon Shakespeare Festival, who has generously lent this space and who holds a particular history in the building of this organization as well. Knowing their intentions are to move forward to reclaim equity, diversity, and inclusion. <sighs> <sighs> Big sigh of relief. <sighs> and as we breathe in our own rhythms, I now toss the baton for her to catch to Mary Catherine Nagel, my beloved creative <laughs> partner. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna stand because I can't I can't sit and toss. I'm like maybe it's the lawyer in me, but um, so I'm I'm really thrilled and honored to be here today, and especially to get to work with Leslie, who is phenomenal, as I'm sure many of you know. And we, I'm really excited about the session that we have. But you know, I think we've constructed this session that we think will get to the core of some of the issues we're facing as we collaborate together on a new musical called um, Sunrise Prayer. Um, but on that note, um, you know, this is really a session that is designed to foster dialogue, to create communication, and we don't, we don't have to follow the PowerPoint. We don't have to follow any set agenda, and um, we are going to be talking about things that are deeply personal because these stories that we're telling are deeply personal, um, and, and sharing them um, does make us vulnerable in a way. So if at any point in time, um, you have something you really want to share or you feel like I don't want to go to that next slide you had something up about a Supreme Court case that I really need to talk about I mean please don't feel like it's not like we're we have this PowerPoint and we have to get through it and um, there's there's no rules if that if that makes sense um, so um, do, 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 or should we do that after we start the, do it now oh. what do you think Okay, so um, because oh, I, I can join after you're right, your instinct was right. Okay, yeah. See, it's very fluid. It's very fluid. Yeah. Um, you're seeing how we work. So I have a little PowerPoint. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but I think it will provide some of the context for how we're. So just a little bit um, background on me. Um, I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation. Um, I uh, was born in Oklahoma. But before the removal, my great-great-grandfather was in what is now northern Georgia, or Rome, Georgia today, if anyone here is from Georgia or familiar with the area. And actually in the 1830s, um, fought very hard in the United States Supreme Court and won an amazing victory um, that I'd love to tell you all about even more in depth, and I've, I have written a separate play on that, um, called Worcester v. Georgia. And it was a phenomenal case in which the Supreme Court said, Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation, the state of Georgia can't come in and try to exercise jurisdiction on slaves. Georgia was trying to kill Cherokees and take their land because, well, many things, but mostly just greed. And they're, you know, they discover gold on Cherokee land, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's where I come from when I come to, to tell these stories and to share these stories. And um, you know, that's a very specific um, perspective. And it's one that um, you know, obviously I can't speak for everyone, but I think when Leslie and I started to work together uh, on this musical, and we have two other collaborators that can't be with us today, Ty and Tataya, who are phenomenal, and they're, they're working on kind of the music and, and the lyrics, and um, by no means is there like anything that's a finished, polished product. It's been a lot of research and, and conversation. Um, but we recognize that we essentially were bringing to the table, um, t you know, two Asian, two Native American collaborators, and what did that mean? Because when you look around the United States, and this is me speaking, and I don't want to put words into Leslie, you know, so, and, um, but I, as, as a native playwright, I see 
and I actually wrote a how wrong piece on this like a couple years ago, but statistically, Americans are more likely to walk into a theater today and see a performance of red face on the American stage than an actual depiction of an actual native artist. That's what, you could do the math, right? If you count up, because Bloody Bloody has red face, um, I mean, I, could, I don't want to start like listing all the red face plays in the world, but they have far more circulation right now, especially once they get to Broadway, mm -hmm. than um, legitimate plays by native artists. Now, I think that we're at the tipping point. You know, OSF has commissioned numerous native playwrights now. They're producing Randy Reinholz's um, musical Off the Rails next year, and and um, and that's amazing. I mean, I don't I don't think they've produced a native playwright in. 90 or so years, but they're doing it. And they're, the majority of American theaters can't point to a single native playwright they've, they've produced. Okay, so that's, that's my little soapbox. But, you know, um, and I can't speak for the Asian community, but it's, uh, my assessment is it seems somewhat similar in that yellow face is still very popular. And it's not about um, pitting us against each other and saying who has it worse. That's, that's a horrible conversation that um, has been used <laughs> for horrible purposes for hundreds of years. So we're not going to have that conversation here today. Instead, we're discussing well, what do we understand about why these, these two yellow face and red face still exist? And how do we come together? If we want to tell a story, which our story specifically is the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II on Indian reservations, okay? And we know these are two tokenized communities whose identities are con frequently appropriated and misrepresented on the American stage. And we're coming together, and I'm not Japanese American, and Leslie's not Native American. <laughs> how, do we, how do we communicate with one another? So that actually, we have a really exciting PowerPoint, because I'm also, I'm also an attorney. So um, I write That's everything the out. beauty of it. But um, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, so yeah, you'll you'll be like, why are we talking about all these legal cases? But so these are some of the questions that we started asking ourselves: is you know, how do we come together and create art for both of our communities without repeating the harmful misrepresentations and appropriations that surround us? There might be some hard conversations. There might be some moments where I write a character and Leslie says, "Are you kidding me?" Like. Where did you get that? You know, where did you get that idea that a Japanese American would ever say something like that? But these are the conversations that we have to prepare ourselves to have and be comfortable having and not come from a place of entitlement or, um, you know, I, I, I'm an artist. I mean, this is what I hear all the time when I say, well, gosh, do you understand that we have this history of, uh, we have the highest rates of suicide in our Native American community. So when you portray, when this is your use of red face on stage and you have the character that's not played by a Native person kill himself, do you understand how that impacts our Native youth who might see this? And they get very, you know, so kind of conversations like that and a lot of times non-Native artists will get very <laughs> defensive um, instead of being open to exploring how something they don't understand about an identity they're putting on stage could really harm or further perpetuate a harmful stereotype. So knowing that we are going to operate in certain areas without sufficient knowledge or experience, can we create some protocols or some agreements between ourselves about how we're going to engage in this work and have these conversations? So that, I want to agree to this because we want to get, I think, more quickly. Did you want to say something? No, I just want okay. to, I was just going to kind of give it Yeah, I don't want to sit here on a PowerPoint. I don't want to be talking at you for 45 minutes. So we can come back to any of these points. And this is a little synopsis of it. And essentially, um, it's about a young girl named Alyssa, and she's Japanese American. She gets picked up by the FBI um, and taken. It's a long story about how plot wise we get there because the FBI was. Picking, many of you may know picking up people on December 7th, um, right after the bombing, but um, picked up different people for various reasons, and then l the next May, you know, rounded everyone up on the West Coast. But um, the, the Poston uh, War Relocation Center was the largest, and it's on the Colorado River Indian Tribe Reservation. And um, a lot of the internment camps were placed on reservations. The Colorado River Indian Tribe um, is, a, is um, I mean, every tribe is unique. But it's, it's a, an especially unique situation because it, um, it was created in 1865, the reservation was, by the federal government. And it's on the traditional homelands of the Mojave. And the Mojave, Mojave in their language means people by the river. They lived by the Colorado River for thousands, since time immemorial. That's their, and, and they have their creation story comes from a mountain that where the where Colorado River Indian tribes is today, their reservation, the mountains just a little bit north of there. That's their creation story. This is where they come from. Well, the federal government just started putting other tribes and people on 
on their reservation, forcibly removing in some instances. So uh, the Chimawavi are there now, and there are Hopi and Navajo folks as well. So you've got four different um, native peoples, right, all living under one tribal government, one now sovereign Indian nation, which is the Colorado River Indian tribe. So they have their own story, and actually, um, to do research with them, I went and met with their tribal council, and um, you know, because I'm not Mojave, I'm not a citizen of Colorado River Indian tribes, right? Like I'm just as much of an outsider as, as anyone else. And said we really, we really want to do this work, um, but we want to do it in a respectful way. And they said, well, please put in, in an application about what the research is that you want to do. And and so I did that. And so I've met with them several times. They did vote, and they gave me approval to do this research and tell this story. And uh, they're like, our only request is that you do the first performance of the musical here on the reservation. I know, isn't that cool? So what you're noticing is part of the protocol. Permission from the elders first, mm -hmm. right? And then our proposal, and then further conversation. Yeah, and so, so I've actually gotten <laughs> to talk to people who were, were around when this was all happening in the 40s, because some of them are still with us, thankfully. And one person who I interviewed, Veronica Homer, who was on the tribal council for a long time and has been a really amazing leader nationally in Indian country, her father worked at the internment camp. And um, I mean, just as, it's crazy to think about. And, and, and at Poston, the tribal council vetoed, so the federal government came in and basically said, we're gonna create an internment camp here uh, for the Japanese and um, you know, that's what we're gonna do, the War Department. And the tribal council for the tribe said, no you're not, this is our land. And we're saying, no, you don't have our permission. And the federal government was like, we don't care. You don't, you don't have a say. And they opened it up anyways. And they, so the tribe still has like all these archives of the, the resolutions they passed saying, this is illegal under our law. We're not allowing this to happen. Um, and then of course, but as you can imagine, um, you know, just like with many tribes across the country, their own life force and their way of sustaining themselves for thousands of years was cut off. Like you can't access those lands to farm anymore. We're gonna kill all the game you live off of, et cetera, et cetera. Where until you get to the point around World War II where most tribal populations are living in extreme poverty because they can't feed themselves the way they have for thousands of years. And it's like, oh, just go be a capitalist. And it's like, well, wait a second. <laughs> you know, we're, we're living in a really remote area. What kind of capitalism do you expect me to ga engage in? So we had high unemployment on the reservation. And so numerous people turn to the relocation center for employment. So you've got this story that is just really um, true based on true things um, that really needs to be told, but is also very sensitive, right? Because uh, we're dealing with Japanese American internment and an Indian reservation and with a very specific story that you know, may, a lot of people might gloss over. So I want to breeze through this so we can get to the text. Um, yes. Do you have something you want no, to No, go, go for it. We're getting there, yeah. Um, so this is you know, October 19th, 1942. President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Um, and so, I mean, uh, for those of you who may not know the exact numbers, it was during World War II that 17,867 individuals of Japanese ancestry, many were American citizens, were incarcerated in Poston. Um, that, and so you can, you can go there today, and actually I wish I had put some of these photos in here, but I didn't. They have, um, in the 90s, they got back together with some survivors of the camp and members of the tribe, and they created a beautiful memorial. That's, that's really, it's very nice. And uh, so you can go to the actual site of the camp. And, and so there's, there's part of it, there were separate sections of the camp. And uh, there was like one, two, and three. And a couple of them are just totally gone, but one is still there. It's, it's actually, it's a little sad because when you go, it's very dilapidated and um, they haven't kept it up. And it just is like, um, so that, I don't know, the tribe has talked about maybe trying to restore it, but it's like, could it make it a museum? I don't know, you know, but maybe that's, maybe that's something that could come from doing uh, a musical like this is that kind of a collaboration and, and restoration of a place to honor and remember. Um, I, I would add too that um, uh, we have folks here that interment is their legacy in the room if I'm correct, yes? What, what camps were your families at, if you care to share? My, my, uh, I'm from Oregon, I'm with a group up there, I asked around how people from Oregon, but yeah. my father was born in Hood River and um, when he was like 16, they were sent to Thule Lake, which had a reputation of being a horrible camp. Uh, so that was really, yeah, it was. Um, my father's family was in the Bay Area in the East Bay in California, and um, they were sent to Topaz in Utah. And my mom's family actually was living in a town called Delta, Utah. My grandfather worked for the railroad. 
And so when he lost his job, they got moved from Delta to Salt Lake City because there were, Delta was a small little railroad town and he had no reason to be there any longer. But strangely enough, Delta is the railroad stop for Topaz. So all of the California Japanese that were going to Topaz got offloaded in Delta as my mom's family was moving to Salt Lake. Yeah, from uh, mine, actually, I'm from Canada. Don't tell anyone. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my uh, family was in Vancouver, and they got oh, moved right. to. Uh, but the system was, um, was similar but different in the sense that in Canada, there was a whole valley, the Slocan, Slocan Valley, which is in, uh, in the interior of British Columbia, uh, the province. And a number of camps and a number of sites were in that area, and my family was there. And then moved east to Toronto. Yeah, understanding my own research to the South Pacific background, and it was a, a very unique experience. Still, all, all the other times. Anybody else? I have four great uncles who were in the 442nd. They weren't <coughs> interned because the family was in Hawaii, but they um, were removed from their their business of the family bakery. And one of three of the uncles moved back. One was lost in Italy. My grandparents and great-grandparents were in Mandanar, and actually my dad's parents met there. Uh, mm -hmm. There were marriages and families started in camp. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know my family was interned in Minidoka, yeah, the Idaho. They were out of Seattle, Washington. So there were 10 camps total, yeah. Um, <laughs> part of this project is to see how awarely, our challenge is to see how awarely we can create a play, never forgetting the historical context. So many plays are created on our, our emotion and our, certainly our imagination opens up. Um, but when we do things around history, but I'm, I'm learning for myself, I think I have to look at historical context no matter what. Um, again, the ground upon which we are set, what informed my imagination? What, it, what shaped me to have this thought, to think that I might want to write a play or create, you know, collaborate um, on any idea, really? Or even the way I move through our confess, our theater, the world. It's informing everything. It's reshaping how I actually proceed in life. And that is coupled with, again, obviously with how you create your day every day. So, did you have a thought, Brandon? I have a yes. question. Um, mm -hmm. In creating a play, why, mus why a musical? And what, what does music, how does music play into the decision process of making musical, but also the cultures. Because I, I think there's a, the musical is very interesting about how that gets translated into cultural play, right? So you're, you see something like um, in the Heights and it's, you know, something about that and then something like Allegiance, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what, does that music represent, how does that music represent the culture? Right, right. So. Well, well, I can't speak for uh, Ty Nicole or Tataya, um, our, our composer and our lyricist, but um, I was interested in a musical and this collaboration because I think, um, at least coming from my own Japanese heritage background and, and deep conversations with Ty around music and rhythm, um, I think one of the ways we feel the essence of who we are is in our own rhythm. I, mean, I mentioned, you know, find your own breath rhythm. Uh, assimilation would manage that. How we pretzel ourselves constantly into a mainstream, trying to work our way through our lives, uh, changes our rhythm. So I was interested in reclaiming my own rhythm and what it would mean for our team to reclaim or utilize their rhythms and um, I feel that's at the essence of culture. And um, a lot of times when we're misappropriated or appropriated, the rhythm's completely obliterated. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it starts with, for me, it starts with that essence. 
And what would it be to have a musical where we have those two cultural rhythms get to figure out how to coexist and to me symbolically as director and collaborator on this, that would be an interesting process and piece even. Mm -hmm. How do we do that if we complicate that different than the simplistic misinformation of a stereotype or an appropriation? So that, that was my charge for myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if musicals, as we know them, share a heightened state, what is that gonna sound like for us? We don't even know yet. <laughs> we don't know yet. And I'll share with you that one of the key things Ty and, and Mary Catherine and Tatiya and I have talked about is we very, we're very clear that this process is going to be a healing process. Mm -hmm. We're not just rising and saying, hey, here we go, da 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 da, -da, -da. <laughs> No, it's actually every step of the way, it may take a while because we're healing as we go. We know mm -hmm. that's got to be part of it if we're going to actually reclaim and find our rhythms mm -hmm. and what that means together. Yeah, just to, I mean, the first idea of it, this really came about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And I've spent the last year and a half going to the reservation in Arizona and just spending time with people and, and creating relationships and not forcing anything and just, um, and actually it was kind of funny, like, I don't know, I mean, I, you know, everyone has their own belief system, but for me, I, I try not to feel, I always want to question, am I, am I feeling entitled to this story? Like, why am I telling this story? What does this story mean to me? And why should I be the one to share it? And maybe I shouldn't be the one to share it. And that's fine too. Maybe it's that I go on this exploration and someone else is supposed to share this story because I truly believe it should be shared. But you know, you just you show you put yourself in the in the place and things happen. And I just ended up sitting next to Veronica Homer uh, at a dinner in San Diego. A mutual we were at an Indian law conference and a mutual friend of ours was having a birthday and she's like, "Yeah, I'm from Crit," and I was like, "What?" You know, and I just because I had just been out there the day before just to meet with people and I hadn't met her. And we're now like in San Diego, which is, you know, a couple hours, several hours away. And anyways, we just started talking. She's like, you have to come, I have to introduce you to this person and this person, you've got to come. And it just, it just happened. And, but I was, I went into it with the idea of maybe this isn't my story to share, you know, and maybe this is someone else's story to share. And, um, and then if I am going to be the conduit, then, then what does that look like? And how do I respect that process? And, um, and, um, and the music part is, you know, it's funny, I've never worked on a musical before. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm writing the book. Um, and I, I love music and I like obsessively listen to it. Like I am a very obsessive, you know, constantly when I write, I'm always listening to music. And, um, and I have a somewhat obsessive personality that might be oversharing, but I will like listen to sometimes like the same song on repeat if I'm like in the zone or whatever. But I don't write music. I don't, you know, it's not. Um, and I, in the, in immediate, and I like this question because I think it raises some important issues like, you know, I'm used to seeing native music depicted on stage or in movies as dun, 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 dun. You know, it's always like some horrible drum beat that has like no affiliation with any actual tribal culture, you know, and, uh, you know, and then it's, it's like some country artist coming out of a teepee and talking about a wigwam and I don't know, it's always some horrible <laughs> music video. So, you know, that's, that's how our music has been portrayed in mainstream culture in America. So how do we, how do we put, so um, the Mojave have these beautiful bird songs. I actually, maybe I can play one. Um, I don't know if I can find this original really quick, but it's like, it's, I, I swear, it'll be unlike anything you've ever heard. And, and when I was out there this last time, um, let me see if I can just find bird song. Because I know I sent it to you guys. Okay. Oh, it would have been in and March. That's somewhat connected to some research that we found with the Japanese culture too. Mm -hmm. We have some similarities, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Man, I thought um, I thought I emailed it to you guys. I did though, right? I think you did. But wh while you look, <laughs> I can share with you that also our inspiration came because my brother goes to the Tule Lake pilgrimage. Uh, again, in Northern California, there's a camp there every two years. And he's uh, gone into, um, was a musician in New York and a French hornist, and then eventually um, became uh, someone who's practicing acupuncture and herb herbology. And he goes to China and is doing his own very deep exploration of healing and practice. And um, 
we keep talking about how do we share with the Tule Lake pilgrimage that was, uh, how do we share a healing process? When, they, when folks go, it is. But we want to bring in the native culture because that particular camp was built on sacred burial ground. And it's like, oh, it's like unconscionable. So how do we continue to develop a healing process for our, our community? And how do we do it together? And when I met Mary Catherine and Ty and uh, Tataya, that made sense to maybe this is part of that a response, at least one of the responses. So um, yeah, yeah, and it also led to in meeting Mary Catherine. It led to, as I mentioned, examining the legislature. You know, everything we have today in this society is largely shaped by uh, the law, right? And so there's, I, I, I share with folks in EDNI workshops now that if we forget when we name off uh, communities of color, we forget natives often, it's because they were forcibly removed. <laughs> there's a reason they fell off the list. They didn't fall off, they were forced off the list. And we just forget. Or sometimes, you know, any group we miss is partly because the normative has pushed them out or forced them out. So we're working to reclaim that and always keep naming, right, in that equity, diversity, inclusion work. So one of the things that also drove me about this piece was how do we um, bring the unnamed back into our stories and reclaim it in the greater culture and American theater in particular, too. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to, I have it on my we can, should we circle back? We can circle back to it later. Yeah, I know. I just really wanted to check it right now. Ooh, oh, you found it? Maybe, uh, yeah, this might. Okay. Well, uh, sorry. This is, like, <laughs> this is, this is not the smoothness. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a plate oh. here. Oh, okay. hey, oh, you have? Yeah. We can also hook it up over there to that jack. Oh yeah. I don't want to play. I don't mean to play the whole thing. I just wanted to share a little bit. So, what do I hook it up to? Yeah, you just hit play on there. Okay. Hold it. Yeah. Um, but it's really finicky because if you go away from the screen, it shuts. Because I don't know how to use technology, and so I. Um, Feels like sort of reclaiming this sort of theater space in this, you know, in this sort of sacred way. No? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, in terms of the music in particular, if it feels or felt important to work with, you know, musicians from the uh, Mohawki, you know, um, tribe, or what that what that was like, or how you negotiated that. I think those are steps that are coming. Uh, you can probably speak specific to, or even just yeah, where you're at. With it. Ty Ty Defoe is very versed at uh, sound and music making in his native uh, tribal culture. Yes, I will. I will just say his culture has nothing to do with the Mojave, right. and the music. I mean, you can probably like any music, right? Like I, I don't know a lot about. I don't want to start making generalizations because I don't know a lot about. Them, but. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, and this is a bit of a generalization, but a lot of people who are not native think that all native music is just like boom, 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 you know, some horrible drum beat. 
And um, the, the drumbeat is very significant in a lot of different cultures, but it is not uniform. It is different. It is unique. And um, you know, an Oto song is very different from a Ponca song. A Native American church song is very different from a Cherokee hymn. A Creek hymn is very different from you know some of the Pacific Northwest music that you'll hear from like the Tulalip. And so there, there is no Native American music. I mean, you can go into like a you know, a store in the Denver airport and hear Native American flute, you know. Um, but like, that's not, you know, once again, it, it's a lot of what people encounter in terms of Native music in the United States is just um, a misappropriation of, um, of, an act, of an, what was at one point an actual piece of music, in my view. <laughs> so, um, so I would love, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't figure out how to play this in a louder map, but I think you'll be able to hear it. I think, I'll be curious, I'm just gonna play a little bit. This is. The Mojave have bird songs, and I um, had never really heard anything quite like this until I went out there. And I, I think it's just so beautiful, and it's it's really kind of amazing. But I got to tape some of it. So, um, so you kind of get the feeling, and um, I just, I love that. And um, so I, was, I got to go out with Veronica, and I, I didn't, you know, I'm not from the community, and I show up, and um, these guys were doing the bird songs, and, and I was like, oh, I really want to tape this. And I look around, like, everyone from there has their, like, you know, their <laughs> iPhones out, and they're taping it, and I was like, okay, I'm going to tape it. Um, but, you know, if I were to, and, and Ty, so I'm not doing, I don't personally, I'm not writing the music. But like, let's say I was, and, I'm, and Ty's gonna take, I think we haven't had this explicit conversation, but we I'm sure will because this is an important question. But yeah, I could put Cherokee music into this musical and probably most Americans wouldn't bat an eyelash because they're like, oh, she's native and that sounds kind of native and there's a drum, you know? Um, <laughs> but like the, this, this, the Mojave bird songs are very, they're so beautiful and specific. you're very specific. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, I think we do and Ty and I have had this conversation of how do we get that, that music into the play, and you do think musical, and you think commercial, or you think, I mean, it doesn't have to be a commercial production, but you think it goes out into the world, and you're not gonna be sitting in the room every time with the production team saying, well, who did you hire that's Mojave to, to sing the bird song? I mean, you know, that may not be realistic. So how do we take that authentic music and put it into a musical um, in a way where it doesn't become bastardized? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a, it's, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's really not. Um, so that's, that's a challenge that we face, but... Um, Sorry, Catherine, can you talk a little bit about the Removal Act versus... Yeah, the so, yeah so what yeah. I really want to talk about is some of the legal framework, and, um, and I have a lawyer, so I always, I always, I always go to that. But, um, and oops, I can share that this is a setup, because we want to do a little bit of an activity with you yep. as well. So these are, and this is some of the where um, the native lands are. So these are just some of the tribes. Just so you know, there. Well, first of all, it was all native land at one point, right? But um, you can see here where some of the tribes and reservations are <coughs> as of today. And I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. But Colorado River is right on the border of California. Oops. Wow, that doesn't work. Um, it's right on the border of California and Arizona. And in fact, they have lands in both states. Um. Sure. Um, so here are some uh, maps that show where some different internment camps are. You can see the uh, Colorado River Indian tribe is going to be on the far left, little bottom corner there, kind of the brownish one. Um, and Gila River had a camp. Um, there's just, there's, there were just a lot that were as I said, a lot of them. You can see, it's kind of still fuzzy in Gila River. Yeah. 
And then do you want to point to Colorado River again? Just to the left. Yeah. Here. A little fuzzy when I get close. Yeah. Um, and then here's kind of a bigger uh, view of like All across the, the country yeah. outside of the South Side. See, you can see the square is the very camp. Yeah. So there's also one in Texas called Christmas City that's not depicted. Um, so for me, as a lawyer, um, you know, we uh, <laughs> we do have this awesome thing called the Constitution of the United States. And it provides due process, and everyone has all these rights. And we're very, you know, you talk to Americans, right? And it's all about our democracy. We take it to the world because the world needs to understand that our democracy is important. We provide freedom to people. We're very proud of the rights in our Constitution. Um, Korematsu is, is a very disturbing case um, where an individual who had been interned in a Japanese American internment camp took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. This violates my due process rights under the Constitution. You know, the president passes executive order 9066, and I didn't commit a crime. And not only that, I've never had my day in court. So usually when you are in imprisoned, you are interned because you've committed a crime, uh, what the uh, Constitution requires is that the state or the federal government, whoever's imprisoning you, must, you know, give you a day in court where you get to see what, what you've been challenged with and litigate it, right? Like, defend yourself. Well, um, the Supreme Court said um, that basically no, <laughs> and that the federal government's actions in forcibly removing 120,000 Japanese Americans from their homes and incarcerating them solely based on their race, that was the only basis, right? There was no you know, individual evaluation of, well, you've committed this crime or you, you've done this. It was just, you are this race, therefore the federal government can take you from your home and imprison you. Very scary. And this decision has never been overturned or overruled. So as of today, in the United States, Executive Order 9066 and the internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II is still totally legal. It's, it, it would be, in my view, it would be like if Plessy v. Ferguson had never been overturned, right? Like, every, you know, we're so proud of Brown v. Board of Education, um, so much that Chief Justice Roberts will give wonderful speeches about it <laughs> at the opening of the African American Museum. Great, he should celebrate Brown Door education. Um, how is it that we still have Korematsu as good law in this country? Um, we also, at the same time, have um, a case in, yes? Um, I just want to add, I beg your pardon, I think this, for this to round up Muslims in this country with yes. no oh, change wow. in the language. Right, so when we uh, are talking about detainment, yeah. as even uh, Trump is, that's scary. Mm. This can be activated at any moment. And Asian Pacific Islanders have a history throughout time of being given, even after fighting in World War I and uh, earlier than that, we've had a history of being given, fighting for citizenship, being given citizenship, and then it's revoked. So we don't have this sense of once you're a citizen, oh, you are. That's it, I'm a citizen. Yeah. It can be taken away at any time. Yeah. But can that order be implemented upon those that created it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends on who's in power, right? I mean, that's the ultimate question is who is in power? And um, just, yeah. I just, I just wanted to name that. That's already been happening. That's right. In the U.S. Yes, right. absolutely. Right. In terms of like people being coined as terrorists through the Patriot Act and mm -hmm. folks being incarcerated in federal facilities all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. So just you know, it's not just me. Yeah. And in, in the Japanese American National Museum, to your point, during um, that response after 9/11, uh, the Japanese community really rose up because the the protocol the system of going toward internment was exactly the same. It's an inciting incident, then there's a hysteria, it gets whipped up, and then the legislation starts to come in, right? And then it gets implemented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. whole document about um, that in the museum. Both the last point, um, it not being overruled or overturned, 
Um, I think, I'm not a lawyer, but I think the, um, uh, the core monster case was, the decision was vacated at a lower level, but they, so it's never been technically overturned or overruled in a sense, but the government gave up its case uh, um, at a lower level. Because oh, Korematsu, then a, the, the lawyers for him appealed that case on on the basis of, of um, uh, I think some government mis, mis uh, uh, behavior or something like that. But, oh, but okay. in any case, Are you, the, you're saying they released him, or? Well, no. They, the, uh, um, this is like 40 years later. Uh -huh. 50 years oh. later, where where they um, at a lower level, lower than the Supreme Court, they the government basically vacated their their. Uh, case and said, sorry, mm -hmm. there was a mistake. Uh, and, and so, and, and lawyers love to, um, <laughs> there are all these nuances, right? Yeah. And, and um, you know, I can explain the procedural makeup of, of, of different cases, but, you know, for me, I, I look at this and I'm like, you know, um, we as, as theater artists know that the power of story, right? Story is powerful. I think that's why we're all in this room. That's why we're all in careers that involve theater to some extent. And I'm also, as a lawyer, I see the power of story in the law, right? And I think there's this constant question of, do the laws shape our culture and our stories, or do our stories shape the law? And I think there's, I think it's a two-way street, but I think that, um, you know, what, this, what is good law for the Supreme Court becomes our story, right? It does. And the Supreme Court tells stories to justify the law. So if you read Korematsu, there's a story about the dangerous, you know, the dangers imposed by these enemy aliens. Like, that story is, in, is, in, is strung throughout. It's used to justify the outcome in this case. So when, when the case, even if, like, let's say, you know, no, I mean, you could, you could talk to someone in the Obama administration and they'd say, of course we're not going to enforce this decision. You know, we're not going to cite Korematsu in a brief and say, well, we get to do X, Y, Z because of Korematsu. So they, so they might argue, it doesn't even have any practical effect anymore. No one's using it. Why is it still on the books? You know, when is the Supreme Court going to make that proclamation, this was a mistake? It was wrong. You know, that hasn't happened. And so, so the narrative that, that, that was used to achieve this result in a Supreme Court case has never been publicly disclaimed, right? Has never been altered. And how does that affect us still today? And I see it as a citizen of Cherokee Nation very explicitly because we have a case that happened in 1978 where the Supreme Court took away the jurisdiction of our tribes to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who come onto our lands and commit crimes. So today, if you're a non-Indian, you could, for instance, walk on to the Colorado River Indian Tribe Reservation as a non-Indian, rape, kill, murder, whatever, and the tribal government can't arrest you, can't prosecute you, they have no jurisdiction to do over anything over you whatsoever. And so Oliphant is a very troubling case, but they cite a horrific case for us from 1823 that's never been overturned called Johnson v. McIntosh. And in that case, an Oliphant case quotes this case, quote, their right, current Indian nations, to complete sovereignty as independent nations are necessarily diminished. And in Johnson v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court said that Indian nations cannot claim legal title to their land, because keep in mind, you know, Korematsu, the, the need is, we need to forcibly remove everyone from their home and lock them up. In Johnson, the need was we need to take their homes from them, right? Like, we, we need that land. And so we need to justify that they're racially inferior. And, uh, and the words were um, uh, savages and heathens uh, was what the Supreme Court used in 1823 to basically say it's, a, it's totally cool to take their land. In fact, it's our legal right to do so. Now, that case has never been overturned. And um, this is these are some awesome quotes from Johnson. The one in the red in the middle is one of my favorite. The Johnson quote the court said, "Conquest gives a title which the courts of the conqueror cannot deny." Basically saying, "We're the court of the conqueror. Indian nations are being conquered. They can't claim title to their land. We're the court of the conqueror." That has never been overturned. And so. For me, I look at, and yeah, the other really awesome quote is the bottom one, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. Blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, it's just horrific. Still good law today. Now, in the 1830s, when my grandfathers uh, were fighting to save Cherokee Nation, President Andrew Jackson passed the Indian Removal Act, which said, uh, basic, on using these principles of law, Indian nations, you're going to be moved out west of Mississippi. And, um, you know, that was, you know, for 
greed and other things, as you can imagine. Uh, they wanted to expand cotton and slavery and everything in the Southeast. At that time, the performance of native identity on the American stage was being appropriated and red face was becoming very popular. There were plays in New York at that time where Indian white people would go on stage and put a fake headdress on and paint their face red and whoa, you know, whatever horrible, offensive, stupid thing you could think of. Indians were portrayed as a costume, as um, you know, a prop, as something to laugh at, as something that could be killed without consequence. Because that's the story, that's the narrative that was necessary to promote this legal framework. And it's, it's sad to me that today in 2016, very little has changed. And this is my whole mantra on Red Face, which we don't have to sit here and read through. But um, I, I guess a part of me, as a theater artist, when I hear our communities talk about, well, why is Red Face more popular than producing actual native artists? Well, why do they use Yellow Face? Look at us, we're here. Why don't they just let us represent ourselves? It's like, well, <laughs> what is the dominant narrative in our legal structure, right? And how have, over the last several hundred years, years performance of our identity been used to support that legal structure in the Supreme Court and across the United States? And, and so how, how, and how do we start to talk about that in a way? Because I think when, um, when most Americans hear hey, do you know that there's this 1823 Supreme Court case and how problematic that is? They're like, oh my gosh, what can we do to change that? Well, let, let Native people tell their own stories. Put actual Native people on stage, because I think the narrative is a false one, right? The narrative that perpetuates these horrible legal um, in, inequalities or injustices depend intrinsically on a false narrative, on a narrative that, that strips us of our inherent identity, right? That dehumanizes us. You have to, to conquer a people, to destroy them, you have to strip them of their humanity first. That's what yellow face and red face do. And so, anyways, I just, I just wanted to, that part of what we're doing here is to place it in the larger context of what does this really mean um, in the United States today? So for me, putting actual, you know, actual Asian people, actual Native American people on the American stage is an act of revolution, um, I think, uh, politically and socially. So, all right, that's that's all I got. Um, <laughs> turn it back over to Leslie. Sure, sure. Um, I, Cindy, thanks for being with us. Yay. So, um, so I wanted to take us through now, just for a few minutes. Um, but I actually want to give the group the opportunity to have choice here because um, this is personal work. So if we want to bring our um, PowerRound session to a close and say farewell to our friends for now about it, it just I'll describe a little bit about the process and I would like you to weigh in to see if you'd like it to, to have our, our session come to a close so we can continue uh, with the activity. Um, I'll be breathing you back generations and giving you the opportunity to process what is your historical context, what have you been carrying with you, and bring us back in to the present here, and we'll have an opportunity to share a bit and for you to be able to uh, just process that, really, because that's the work, the basis of the work that we've been um, conducting for ourselves, along with all this research that we've shared. Um, in order to continue to move through this process, hopefully as awarely as possible, and even reclaiming, like I mentioned, our, a, a thoughtful process for ourselves. So is that something um, that you would like to do without being on camera? I think that's my instinct, but I just want to make sure we have the will of the group. I see a couple of yeses. Okay, I think that's all we need to know then. Yeah, even if one person feels that way. So for HowlRound, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, I hope folks who have been able to tune in are enjoying the Katakam Fest um, captures that we've been able to provide. And we'll sign off for now. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK. <laughs>